next guest is an internist, a hospitalist, healthcare revolutionary. He's an internet sensation, and please welcome international hip hop star <laughs> and D list celebrity, <laughs> Z Dog MD. D list celebrity. I think with a little hard work, I can get that up to C minus list celebrity. So <clears throat> there was a guy who came up to me, his name was Billy, and he said it was okay if I cursed during this thing. Do you, do you guys care? I'll stay on the carpet and curse. Do you guys think I need to go to a pump party? What do you guys think? Look on the flat. Fuck. <clears throat> what happened to Miley Cyrus, okay? When we go to medical school, we kind of feel like this. We're idealistic, we're fired up, we want to change the world. Then we get done with our training and it's like this. It's incredible. And the thing is, you know, I actually uh, know the doc who takes care of her. He gave me uh, the uh, x-ray after this performance. <laughs> I know, she broke her right hip twerking. <laughs> it's a twerk-related injury. Twerkman's comp was, you know, there's a whole thing. You know, could you imagine what the radiologist read when he read this? He was like, <clears throat> yeah, there's a right prosthetic hip uh, well-seated with some surrounding osteopenia and sclerosis of the acetabulum. Incidentally noted, is a ground glass opacity <laughs> overlying the recto sigmoid uh, contour suggests Coca-Cola, cannot rule out Pepsi, <laughs> suggests clinical correlation. But you know, it's funny, in medicine, it's so, so interesting how we can focus on something like the hip and miss the elephant in the rectum. And so today, what I want to talk about, the last time I was at Essentials was 2011. And since then, I shaved my head, left my job at Stanford as a hospitalist, and moved to the desert to try to change medicine. So there's stuff to talk about there. But more importantly, I want to talk um, because my parole officer tells me that this satisfies my community service requirement. <laughs> this is my dad. Uh, some of you guys may have seen him before. He's uh, a foreign medical graduate from India, or as they're better known in the United States now, a uh, primary care physician. <laughs> <laughs> he was sort of the model of the risk-averse risk doctor. So he would always tell me, you know, you are so crazy trying to do this rip-rap, hippity-hop nonsense that you're doing. He's like, you know, don't think outside of the rectangle, okay? Do you remember what happened when I tried to do that? Your uncle Saurabh and I, we came up with this curry and masala enema. It was very effective. What are you laughing for? Dad, you can't sell something called the ethnic cleanse. No one will buy it. Okay, okay, what about this? What about my other idea? Nobody took, you know, something for alcoholics, a support group, you know, called AA. And I was like, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's already been, no, 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 no. You can't make an alcoholic not drink. This is Ascites Anonymous. You know, they come, they give the secret handshake. They all get in a circle, put the belly side by side, and do the fluid wave. <laughs> it, nobody came. Dad, you had a lactulose bar, okay? These guys, these guys don't want, I'll, I'll take a strawberry lactulose and a double from my friend, please. There's no friend there, sir. He always had advice about specializing. So he would always tell me, you know, don't do primary care. They don't pay you to think. They pay you to do things to people's rectums. <laughs> After this conference, I pretty much agree with that. And you know, in general, anyone who's grown up with Asian parents knows the pressure. <laughs> so, so my wife is Chinese. Her parents obviously are Chinese. They're all doctors. There's one lawyer in the family, and he's basically disowned. And <clears throat> my, <laughs> they, you know, they pushed my wife into medicine. And uh, her dad, they grew up actually in, um, in Columbia, South Carolina. So he had this odd combination of a Chinese accent with a Southern accent. And so her dad was always trying to convince me that General Lee was a Chinese guy. <laughs> and he would be like, the South shall rise again. And I was like, that's not cool, dude. That's not cool. The strange thing, he knew General Tsao, totally American. He's like, no wonder, <laughs> I'm getting my accents confused. He's like, no, one, no wonder you Americans so fat. The chicken is so sweet. 
I'm like, that's General Sal, my friend. And then you end up going to become a pre-med because your parents push you into it, right? You're thinking you're going to change the world, but at the same time, mom and dad are like, be a doctor. And you end up in the most competitive kind of shitstorm you could imagine with people you wouldn't even want to have lunch with, let alone spend a career with. There was this guy at Berkeley. He brought a folding chair to every class so he could sit in front of the front row. <laughs> so for the purposes of this talk, let's call him Arash because that was in fact his name. <laughs> and I no longer give a fuck. <laughs> and so I Googled him recently and I found out he didn't even get into medical school. And I was like, sucker. He went to business school and now his LinkedIn avatar is his yacht. And I went to medical school and dealt with this. <laughs> medical school is a fascinating thing. It's a series of small humiliations where they take a human being and they deconstruct it, and then they don't do us the courtesy of putting it back together again. Okay? So I remember <laughs> we were 21 years old, microbiology lab, and the professor's like, bring in your own stool sample, we're gonna culture it. And we're like, are you fucking kidding? <laughs> so we're all like, <laughs> <laughs> tiniest little micron of feces wrapped up and hidden away. We're like rocking back and forth in class, humiliated. And then in walks one of our classmates, and she's holding a fucking mason jar <laughs> over her head with a steaming pile of Lincoln logs in it. And all of us were like, <laughs> and it wasn't because of the logs. We were disgusted with ourselves because we'd each brought in such a tiny piece of shit. <laughs> you know, and that's when the mad rush to the bathroom began because, yo, son, it was on. <laughs> oh, God, you know, and then, and then they wonder why we're little dicks. You know, we just become so weird coming out of it. And I'm struggling, like, okay, what's, what am I going to specialize in? And I'm like, well, I'm kind of funny. I like to have a good time. I want to go with people that are kind of like me, that really enjoy life and can, can take and make a joke. So, you know, uh, it was, there was no other choice. <laughs> Least funny people in the universe, internists. Least funny. Um, <laughs> but actually, let's compare emergency medicine versus internal medicine, hospital medicine. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Internal medicine docs use Occam's razor to find the simplest explanation for complex situations. Emergency department physicians use Occam's razor to trim their soul patches. <laughs> emergency, emergency department physicians have to outsource their ankle rules to Canada. Okay, how un-American. Internal medicine doctors have one ankle rule. Call ortho, because we don't know shit about ankles. <laughs> and finally, internal medicine docs push their kids to study constantly so they can get into Harvard or another Ivy League school, so they can get admitted. Emergency department docs expect their kids to free climb El Capitan, sleep on a ledge in the middle of the night, and shit in a bag. <laughs> and when they don't get admitted to Harvard, the ER doc just calls up and pushes the admission through anyways, because they can get any kind of shit admitted. <laughs> but what do we have in common? Well, we have the word medicine in our name. The other thing we have in common is that <clears throat> we think that Jayco, Ortho, and Press Ganey can all suck it. <laughs> We, we also both believe that we're here to help patients, and yet so many obstacles are put in our way to do exactly this. Technology gets in the way. <laughs> the next thing we're going to find in a rectum is your cell phone, sir, if you don't put it away. And then we're tired of being manipulated. Access to, baby, in effect. And when we don't give patients what they want, 
Guess who suffers? Us. Now, if I ever find the person who's responsible for Press Ganey, I know the perfect device to use on them. <laughs> because they are full of shit, okay? That's called pay for performance, bitch. Ah, <laughs> oh, but you know, any monkey can do medicine, but it takes a higher primate to do emergency medicine, like an ape. When you are feeling like a commodity, we might as well just replace ourselves with a monkey. So I actually found one. This is Dr. Bobo. He's a PA, primate assistant. He has a fanny pack with Haldol, Ativan, Etomidate. For Scott Weingart, he's got a little ketamine. He throws in some Droperidol just because he doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> the great thing about him is, you know, when, he, when a patient's agitated, he just comes up, <laughs> it's easy to page him. You just, oh, he comes flying in. You know, Down goes the patient. He sees an EKG with ST elevation. He's like, ha, 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 ha. He sees flash pulmonary edema. Ha, 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 ha. Reaches in his fanny pack, bags a nitro paste. He's just, oh, ha, 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 ha. He can smell a drug seeker from a mile away. And when he does, oh, you can believe that there is some feces that starts flying. And despite this being 17 different kinds of Jaco violation, he still has the highest press gainy scores of any prehensile creature in the hospital. What? And so for 10 years at Stanford, I became basically Dr. Bobo by the end, running through the ER, flinging feces, completely burned out. And the funny thing is in that ER, nobody even noticed that I was flinging feces because it was just the standard of care. And, <laughs> and it really, it, it, it kind of all came to a head one day. I finally had the last straw when I was basically um, checking my Hotmail account and security comes in and cuffs me and throws me up against the wall. And I'm like, why? <laughs> what? Oh, I tell you, you know, the whole thing, I'd had it. And I, I was so burned out that I started making silly videos, putting them on YouTube. I got like over a million views making videos about how burned out docs are and also teaching patients that vaccines are safe and effective. And I was having a great old time, but I realized, you know, this is not helping the culture of medicine. It's just pointing out what's wrong. Well, I had a friend who was really good at fixing cultures. This is Tony Shea, he's the CEO of Zappos. He built an entire company, Zappos, into a billion dollar thing that he sold to Amazon because he thought if you get the culture right, everything falls into place. And he called me up and said, hey, I've seen your videos. You're uh, really A, not funny, and B, insane, so perfect to quit your job, move to downtown Las Vegas, and help us try to fix healthcare as part of this big urban revitalization project we're doing. And I was like, <laughs> when do I come? <clears throat> and so what we did was we moved to Vegas, we started studying the system, we said, oh, guess what? It doesn't take a New England Journal article to tell you that primary care is broken. We spend 4% of our total healthcare dollars on primary care and 96% on the failure of primary care. We have our ER docs working effectively as primary care docs, which they don't want to do, and it's not cost effective. So why don't we fix primary care and by extension fix the rest of healthcare? So what we did is we're building a clinic, and what you see here is a huddle. Doctors, health coaches, a licensed clinical social worker, a nurse, all working together every morning to go through every patient that we're going to see in that outpatient clinic that day, and a bunch of patients that we're not going to see, and reach out to them so that we can take care of them. No insurance accepted. It's a membership model, flat fee around 75 bucks a month that your employer can pay for your uh, employees, or with the Obamacare thing. See, my feeling is this. When life gives you Obamacare, make Obama laid. So what we did is we took this and we actually put it on the healthcare exchange with the Nevada Health Co-op wrapped with an insurance product. Now lower income people can get subsidies to get concierge level wellness care. There's a yoga studio on site, a teaching kitchen, and there are no weights, no co-pays, et cetera. This is open access primary care. You see a 44% drop in ER visits in pilot clinics that have used this model. And this is what we're doing in downtown Vegas. We call it turntable health, a revolution in healthcare. And we're opening this December. So <clears throat> I started to think, what is it that's different about me now and how I look at the world? It used to be I'd look at a patient like this and I would judge them, as many of us do. He's fat, he doesn't listen, he's still eating, he's got diabetes, right? What is that going to do to your sense of empathy, your ability to actually have a healing relationship? 
It's going to destroy it, right? And we're so busy being judged and judging each other in our medical culture that this is how we behave. What if we saw the world like this? Human beings are these churning interactions of neurons, genes, environment, everything that happened from when we were born until this point when I'm standing here determines what I'm going to do. How do you blame or judge a storm? All you can do is affect the barometric pressure around it so it blows in the right direction, change the system around it, change the way we talk to each other, our culture, the way we interact, and that storm will blow right. And now when you look at this patient, you can look at what's around him and realize he's going through a freaking drive through Okay? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I took this picture in Fresno, California. This happened, people. And now I look at him and I go, this is not his fault. What the fuck are we doing as a society, right? All these storms interacting every single day. Think about the ER. How hard is it to predict the weather? That's medicine. And guess what we get to do every single day is actually affect the weather with our choices and our actions and our words and the way we non-judgmentally take care of patients and change the system. So when I told my family I was moving to Vegas to do this, they were thrilled. And when I told my daughter that she couldn't bring her toys because we didn't have enough space, she was thrilled. <laughs> and I am totally out of time, so I'm going to take a lesson from nature here and step off. Thank you very much.